Uh, we have with us today Dr. Sean Reif, professor and co-founder of Site AI, and Dr. Igor Hi, Sean. And Dr. Igor Osipov, Vice President for Academic and Institutions at Site AI. Welcome and thank you for offering to present Site to us today. Before I hand over the mic to you, I would like to uh, say briefly a few words about why we are doing this, how this collaboration came about, because in the words of our director, Natalia, I think uh, this is a, a pretty inspiring story. So a few months ago, um, Damian, who is a member of our team and who might be in the audience today, I am not sure if he is, sorry to put you on the spot, but Damian told the team about a cool artificial intelligence tool that he used at university to um, help with his studies. Natalia then looked into it and agreed that it was something worth checking out. And she encouraged our board to take an interest in site as well. The tool was then included in the recruitment process for open science manager post, so my post. And as part of the process, I had to present um, about site. Um, and um, here we are today, the rest is history. We know that site is a tool that can make it easier to search literature databases, find appropriate sources, check the reliability of your citations to some extent. And so this is something that could be very useful and relevant to our community. I'm sure Sean and Igor will tell us uh, much more about it. But we want to provide um, Wikipedians with this tool. But first, of course, we want to check it in practice. We want to see how actually the tool can be useful to the Polish speaking Wikipedia community. And for this, we are hosting this webinar as well as organizing a six week long free trial period to use site. We will be asking for your feedback at the end of this uh, trial period. And this will be extremely valuable for us in deciding our next steps. We also know that AI will be a subject quite prevalent at the upcoming Wikimania. So for those who are attending, hopefully this will be a nice chance to start these conversations early. All right, this is it from me. Over to you, Igor and Sean. Thank you very much, um, Cassia. Um, I will start sharing my screen. Um, we're happy to work with uh, Wikimedia uh, and with your team. And I'd like to thank um, Natalia, Cassia, and uh, our colleague Beatrice, who is with us as well, and uh, Sean for, for joining today. Um, I will do a very small introduction and then give floor to our co-founder, uh, Professor Reif. So about site, um, as many uh, tools appeared in the last year or two uh, in the space of AI and LLMs, uh, site is quite different from all of them. Uh, first of all, in terms of the age, uh, we started in 2018, where um, most of the names that you're you know, knowing today uh, were not ex in, in existence. And so um, since then, we spent um, first years building direct relations with um, publishers, so we're pretty much uh, entrenched into the publishing industry. And um, this is one of the biggest uh, differences in, in our opinion, because uh, all the data that we source uh, for a site database come directly from uh, the original sources, for, from the publishers, from the data holders, from the data custodians. Um, and essentially, um, when we started, we had... Um, some users and now in 2024 uh, our user community exceeded uh, 1 million uh, people and about half of them are uh, students uh, master students phd students um, uh, uh, undergraduate students and the other half are professionals uh, like you um, and and a lot of them come from university uh, side and at the end of uh, last year, we became part of Research Solutions, which is a publicly traded company. So we're scaling up um, all over the world at the moment. So what is it 
behind site that makes it really unique. Um, we think that um, you know through working uh, with publishing industry, uh, we are building one of the largest uh, independently sourced reference uh, database in the world. So far, we cataloged uh, more than 2 billion references. And because we have also solved another big challenge for AI, which is copyright, uh, we have a lot of indexing agreements and partnership agreements with the publishing industry. And so we're all also able to mine full texts, um, both in open access as well as behind the paywall, um, full text articles, books, uh, preprints. And through that, we've been able to index more than 1.3 billion citation statements. So these are kind of two uh, uh, data points that, that allow us to um, build a new uh, interface to the scientific data. Uh, in the past, um, you were confronted with either too little information in terms of just abstract and uh, a title and metadata, or too much information, which is eight to nine million full text publications appearing every year uh, worldwide. So our approach is kind of in, in the golden uh, middle, we are looking at citation statements which actually goes into the full text and we're taking several phrases before the reference and then several phrases after the reference. That gives us a pretty clean and um, um, comprehensive understanding of a context for a, a scientific citation. And then what we do, uh, we classify those citation statements using uh, deep learning models. We classify them into three categories. Um, again, seemingly simple, uh, before cite, every paper had just a number. So for example, this paper was cited 100 times. What was behind that 100? Nobody knew. So whether you know 100 people supported the scientific paper, mentioned it, or contrasted it, that was not known. With cite, we're able to actually tell if people are agreeing with scientific claim, uh, mentioning it in some context, or actually uh, challenging or contrasting it. And in front of you is an example of a supporting citation statement. And it is supporting because it says here, in accordance with a previous report. And then there is a reference to the previously published paper. Um, and then the author continues explaining uh, scientific merits of, of, of that paper. Again, seemingly simple, it does provide a new way of looking at uh, scientific data because somebody uh, publishing in 2019 in the Matter Journal was able to validate or replicate previously published research. That is something really important because uh, science um, reproducibility gap is something of, of, a, uh, of a fundamental value to all of us. So that's an example of a supporting citation statement. Uh, second category is mentioning citation statements. Those are uh, largely non-judgmental. They are coming from uh, literature reviews, introduction sections, methodology sections, and they provide very rich context for scientific endeavor. And then the third category is contrasting uh, citation statements. Those can be very interesting because they could um, point you to um, a direction of, you know, for example, somebody is able to say that we actually failed to reproduce XYZ publication, or uh, we found results that are different from XYZ publications. Uh, it actually can even catch nuances um, where in the beginning, for example, the authors agree with previously published research, but then they found something else and they are describing it. And so we can actually tell, uh, um, uh, catch and, and show this to a reader. So this is what we call smart citation. Um, it provides you with full context of a reference, and then it is classified um, uh, quite uh, uh, clearly as a supporting mentioning or contrasting. This is my last slide um, before I give floor to my colleague and co-founder uh, of Cite, uh, Sean. So essentially, one of the things that Cite is allowing you to do, it actually gives you um, insight into a lot of various publication types. 
Um, you could look at peer-reviewed articles, of course, like in other golden standard solutions. But here at site, you can look at more than just that. You can look at books, you can look at uh, uh, preprints, you could look at biographies. So any type of publication uh, that science lives in, this is what you can uh, explore uh, with site. And of course, you know, a huge part of it is uh, AI, artificial, artificial intelligence. But before we get there, um, I really uh, encourage you to look at the actual foundation of data. Uh, what is the data behind that AI? Because often uh, AI is just a function of the data that it dwells upon. So we cover more than 187 million uh, different publication types. Uh, we also uh, work directly with, again, publishing industry and uh, key players in it. We sit uh, on the working groups with Open Alex, with Crossref. Uh, we work with Archive, uh, MedArchive, DataCite, um, ORCID in terms of the authors. We also have a lot of data for uh, organizations. So if you're looking at uh, universities, colleges, uh, foundations, funders, governmental institutions, companies, any entity that produces and publishes research, we would have a, an affiliation board for it. And thanks to um, uh, um, collaboration with Open Alex, we cover a lot of journals, more than 103,000 journals. Um, and that also allows us to really be both language friendly as well as content friendly uh, to a lot of sources otherwise hidden for the user. Um, at this point, I'd like to stop and um, uh, give floor to Sean. Over to you, Sean. Yeah, so um, thank you, uh, Igor, for, the, for that uh, great presentation. I really uh, appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, and so what I'm going to spend my time doing uh, here today is uh, really just kind of walking through and, and giving some concrete uh, examples of what I Igor uh, has uh, was just discussing. Um, so uh, in, in demonstrating what site is, I, I like to start by uh, just sort of showing uh, the world that I think probably most of us are familiar with to some degree, and that is the world of the journal article. Um, so uh, in addition to my work as a uh, head of academic outreach um, at SITE, uh, I'm also a university professor uh, here at Murray State University in uh, Kentucky in the States. And uh, this is a paper, my, my PhD is in social psychology. And this is a paper that I wrote as I was finishing up graduate school. And uh, the publisher of this paper, Taylor and Francis, uh, they show you know, some basic information about the article, uh, but they also have this panel over here, which is uh, sh showing a list of papers that Taylor and Francis has found that cite my paper. And so getting into what Igor was just mentioning, uh, if you wanted to see sort of what uh, other papers are say saying about my paper, if you want to sort of see uh, you know, how that work has been discussed in the scholarly literature, uh, you could go to these 72 papers, find the reference to my work, and then read it. Um, but of course, that is not a very productive way to live your life, right? So the uh, first product that Site introduced, as, as Igor was describing, uh, was basically an automated way of doing that and also classifying the citations. So uh, if you go to the Site page for that same paper, uh, we see it's the same title, uh, same metadata for, for the paper we were just looking at. Um, you'll see a lot of that same information but what makes site different is the text in each of these panels, um, which is, of course, as, as we were just hearing, a text not from my paper, not from this paper, but actually from papers that are citing this paper. So this is all text from, from other sources. And with each of these article report pages, uh, you can sort and filter all of that data uh, by a, a number of, of uh, fields, so the year it was published, the type of article, the uh, journal that they appeared in. 
Um, but uh, as Igor was just mentioning, there you, we've also gone a, another step, and that is we've classified each of those citation, what we call citation statements. That's just the text of the citation itself. And uh, we've classified them as one of three types, uh, as either supporting. So for example, this one right here, these results closely parallel those of Rife et al. 2014. It's what we call a supporting citation. Uh, the opposite of that would be a uh, contrasting citation. So failure to replicate Rife et al. or our results are not in accordance with Rife et al. Those would be examples of potentially contrasting citations or just the mentioning citation, which is where someone references another paper, but they're not making any kind of uh, judgment about it. They're simply referencing it in passing. Uh, we've managed to collect all of this data. We have at this point, um, our citation statements, I think are in 1.3 billion uh, in our database. And um, I'll go ahead and just point out right here uh, because I, I, I know it's relevant. It might be of interest uh, to some of the folks on this call. Um, we actually um, have used that data uh, along with data from uh, Wikipedia. Um, so in, in doing some work uh, that uh, Wikimedia uh, has been uh, responsible for, um, we've, uh, we actually did a study of the scientific articles that are cited in Wikipedia and uh, evaluated them on a number of, of metrics, basically um, whether or not they had been subsequently replicated. So our articles in Wikipedia subsequently, uh, you know, followed up with successful replications. Uh, you know, so if you're, if an article uh, discusses a, a paper, you know, is that paper subsequently supported? Um, and we also looked at uh, the extent to which papers cited uh, in Wikipedia might have been the subject of an editorial notice or of a retraction. Um, sorry, I thought that there was a, yes, right down here, yeah. So um, you can see here on in table one where it kind of mentions uh, just the uh, differences between what we see, for example, in Wikipedia and Web of Science. And we also found that uh, I believe it was around half of Wikipedia articles actually were citing a, a piece of scholarship that had uh, subsequently been retracted but apparently not with any acknowledgement of the retraction. Um, and I should point out, this is uh, not anything that's terribly unique to Wikipedia. We find some of the many same patterns uh, within the scholarly scientific literature uh, as well. So um, certainly nothing uh, unique about that, but I think as an interesting way that you can apply uh, some of our data to a tool that people all over the world use every day, um, in a way that might help uh, ho hopefully improve the quality or the quality of discourse or the quality of content uh, on that tool. Okay, so that is the, uh, the first product that we introduced and sort of at the core of CIT, which is the citation statements and our ability to classify them and work with those citation statements. Um, we think of this article report tool as sort of an evaluation tool. It's a way of sort of saying, all right, what, um, you know, what does uh, the literature, what are people saying about this paper? Uh, but there are other tools that we introduced subsequently. So I'll, I'll go ahead. We have basically three major products. I'll go, I'm going through each of them in turn. The uh, article reports, that was the first one. Uh, the second is our uh, discovery tool, site search. So, And I have some uh, examples here in a minute that I'll, I'll get to uh, in Polish as well. Um, so, uh, but just using a sort of uh, typical example, I'm searching here for the keywords beta blockers and hypertension. So high blood pressure using uh, this particular class of drug to treat uh, that condition. And uh, like many tools, you can uh, sort and filter all of these search results. Uh, by a number of different fields. So the journal that they appear in, uh, the institutions uh, that are associated with each of those papers, the type of publication or the uh, topic classification. Um, but because CITE has data on not just the papers themselves, but the articles citing those papers, uh, you can actually go one step further 
and use that information to further filter these results. So um, I'm going to go ahead and, and just right here, I'm going to tell the, uh, the system uh, in this filtering mechanism to only show me search results that have received at least 11 supporting citations. That is to say, uh, you know, don't show me any any papers that haven't received at least some subsequent uh, replication or some subsequent, you know, empirical uh, follow up that was consistent. So it's a a sort of uh, proxy for quality by knowing that all of the papers in this list, you can see it's much reduced now. Uh, all thirty eight of these papers have received at least some sort of later verification. Uh, we can also in our, our search, go beyond simply the data about the paper. So right now with this paper search, we're really focusing on things like uh, article titles, keywords, abstracts. Um, but we can actually, because we have the full text of the papers themselves, we can actually do what we call a citation statement search. And that's going to actually uh, go beyond simply that paper metadata, and it's actually going to search that content of those citations that we were just looking at earlier when we were looking over here. Uh, it's going to search these, the actual content of the citations. And so that's one way of sort of peering past the sort of paper um, metadata and looking deeper into the content of each of these papers. And uh, in just one second, I'm going to uh, get into our, our third product, uh, which is sort of the one that people are are speaking about the most uh, recently. Um, uh, you'll see, I think, why that is especially valuable. Uh, but before I do that, um, I'll just note that there are some additional features associated with search. Um, so, for example, we have a full Boolean query builder. If you're used to uh, conducting searches in that way, we support that format. Uh, we also have the ability to um, generate a, an analysis of search results. So it's sort of a summary of search results. You can get notifications for a search result. So um, if, uh, for example, um, uh, so uh, sorry. So for example, if uh, you know you want to be notified when uh, new publications come out on these search results, you can have it do that. Um, and then uh, with all of Sites tools, you can see this in our, our search results. Uh, you can export those results uh, as a num in a number of formats. So CSV for, for example, Excel or Google Sheets or RIS format for uh, many different reference managers um, uh, who use it. Um, and uh, you can see also, we, we also have the same uh, tool with our article reports. You can export all of these uh, in a number of different uh, formats. We, we try to be very good about being interoperable. So we like to go where our users are. And uh, you know if, if you're used to using a certain tool or a certain reference manager, um, we want to be compatible with all of that rather than forcing our users to sort of re, you know, readjust their, their workflow to accommodate us. Um, and there are a number of different features. I'm happy to discuss this more in the Q&A. There are a number of different ways that we can we do that uh, on a number of different tools. Um, okay, so uh, search is what I think of as sort of our second major product. We, we've done sort of evaluation, we've done discovery. Um, and then that brings us to the third major product, which I'll uh, bring up here. Um, this is uh, what we call Site Assistant. And so Site Assistant is a sort of next generation uh, research assistant that is very much like large uh, other large language model tools, um, but it's tailored for research purposes. Um, if you've used, um, I'm going to just sort of use it as an example, uh, ChatGPT, simply because that's the tool that I think people are most broadly familiar with. Um, and certainly if you've played around with ChatGPT, it's undeniably a powerful technology. Um, so uh, it, it, it is un, you know, undeniably impressive, uh, at least on a superficial level. Um, but there are a couple of major problems that uh, we see that really um, pop up if you're trying to use a tool like that, you know, ChatGPT or, or a tool like it, 
uh, for you know what I think of as sort of serious research purposes. Uh, so I'll, I'll pick on two issues here. Uh, the first is that sometimes these large language models um, will lie to you. Um, and it's just a function of the way that they are, are trained. They're trained to sound human and hopefully to give accurate responses. Um, but uh, that's not its sort of, you know, accuracy is not its so sort of first order, its sort of first priority. So sometimes they will say things that are simply not true. And to make that sort of situation a bit worse, they will sometimes actually give references that are not real. Um, so they will uh, hallucinate is the term that's used in, in the field of, of AI. Uh, they will hallucinate references that do not exist. Uh, I like to highlight one example. Um, uh, I was talking to someone a, a while back who was was talking with ChatGPT in um, the uh, uh, about a very specialized topic um, in, in uh, biomedicine. And um, it was an area of expertise that he had. And at one point, ChatGPT said, as a reference, you should read this book uh, by this person. And the reference was to a book that he had supposedly written, except that he had actually not written it. ChatGPT had just sort of imagined that he had written it. And so it was a sort of surreal experience of uh, you know, having a machine tell you you had written a book that you had never actually written. Um, so that's... That's one issue that we have with these tools for, again, serious research. The second issue that I like to point out is that, um, uh, yeah, I see someone noted in chat, confabulation, yes, confabulation is an even, I like that, that's a good one. I'm going to, to borrow that from you, uh, Michal, if, I, if, I, if you don't mind. Um, yes, so um, anyway, so the, uh, the second issue, with, uh, with ChatGPT for research is that it's time limited. So uh, the, um, the, uh, the systems that are trained on a, a body of text, a corpus of text, and that training has to occur at some point in time. And if something in the world happens after that training occurs, the large language models simply don't know that they exist. They don't know that something happened. And uh, so, you know, if, if your large language model was trained in December of 2024, or 2023, rather, it's now, you know, you know, July of 2024. If something um, had something, you know, if something occurred earlier this year, uh, a large language model trained in 2023 is simply not going to know about that event. Um, and that's just a sort of fundamental limitation of way these, these models are implemented. So um, let me go ahead. I'm going to um, give some examples here right now. Um, and I'm going to do this in Polish. And I will go ahead and just apologize beforehand uh, because I am the uh, typical monolingual American. I am having to rely on Google Translate for my translations. Um, but uh, we're, we're asking here uh, about the latest variations of uh, COVID and uh, if they are more contagious. Um, and we're actually, as you can see, we're instructing the system to please look for sources that are written in Polish and provide answers in, in Polish. Um, and so the, uh, the system is now basically breaking down the text of my question and the instructions that I gave it. And it is identifying key terms in those uh, uh, references, or excuse me, in that question. Uh, and it's going to use that uh, those key terms to formulate a series of search searches, a series of queries to the site data. Um, and in fact, you can actually click on each of these links under searches used. And uh, you can actually see the uh, search results that the site assistant saw in that process. Um, and so all of these are going to be uh, references that that are uh, you know that are part of those searches. The system is then going to um, identify a subset of articles 
that it views as the most relevant or worthy of, of uh, looking at. And it's going to read, um, I put that in, in quotes, read each of those 31 publications and uh, then um, determine you know, which ones are relevant to include in our answer here. And uh, in this answer, um, it will then make factual statements, but every one of them will be uh, associated with a reference. And each of these uh, references um, will be, uh, you'll be able to hover over each of them and you'll be able to see a link to the paper as well as the text that is extracted from the paper uh, that is relevant to that part of the answer. Um, and so we can uh, do this in a number of different ways. Um, in fact, I just noticed that uh, uh, we had one from, I believe, Kasia uh, shared. I'll go ahead and, and do another one here. Um, this uh, getting into proteins and the immune system. And again, instructing the system to uh, give responses uh, uh, or to use sources that are in uh, Polish. Um, so again, it goes through this system of identifying uh, references that are relevant, composing the response. Um, again, in this case, we've found 25 publications that it's going to go through and use as, as part of the, the answer. Um, so yes, thank you for that. Um, I do want to be mindful of the time but um, and make sure that we have time for Q&A, but um, I'm going to just take a few more minutes uh, and briefly uh, talk about some of the additional features associated with Site Assistant. Um, so the first thing that I'll point out is that with all of these, um, you can export everything that Site Assistant is doing. Again, we we try to make, you know, interoperability is a priority for us at Site. So in each of these, you can export the references in a variety of formats, be compatible with uh, other tools. And Anytime it comes up with uh, these responses, it's going to generate this reference list over here, which is sort of a summary of the references that it's found and what it's extracted from those references. We also have the ability to specify uh, settings um, in ways that, that make uh, Site Assistant much more narrowly tailored to specific use cases. So um, I'll go through a few examples of this. Um, so for one thing, uh, you can use what we call a structured response. And a structured response, you know, in the examples I was giving earlier, we have it writing, you know, a few paragraphs of text. With a structure, um, uh, in a structured response, uh, it's actually going to give you a table listing all of the references um, that it found and a summary of why they are relevant. So that's one way of using Assistant to create sort of an, an annotated bibliography or a first draft of an annotated bibliography or a reading list um, if you're trying to familiarize yourself with a new area and want to go to those primary sources. And of course, as a professor, I always, always encourage that. Um, you should always uh, use primary sources. Uh, you can also specify the date range that Assistant uses. So, for example, if you only wanted it to, uh, you know, include newer references, you could say, hey, only give me papers that um, are from 2020 to the present or even the future. There we go. Uh, you can also uh, tweak the types of publications that Site Assistant will use when it's doing its searches. Uh, so you can, for example, specify that you only want it to reference uh, or to use randomized control trials. Or maybe you also want to include uh, meta-analyses or a sometimes referred to as a, a Cochrane review. Um, you can specify the different types of publications the system is allowed to, to search for, and it will filter the
those searches uh, by those types. You can modify the citation style. We try to have the most common ones in here. You can alter the model, the language model that it uses. Uh, currently, we are using a GPT 3.5. We are investigating GPT-4, but so far we have not seen any uh, advantages to, to GPT-4. We're also investigating other language uh, providers such as Haiku, um, which will uh, alter somewhat the sort of uh, style of the composition of the response. Uh, the you know length of the response, the number of publications it's going to sort of focus on, on using. Um, also, the way that it ranks the references. So um, I'll go back here really quickly. You'll notice here it, it came up with 30 publications. Um, and it's going to have to determine, all right, which one of those do I want to use in my response? And uh, uh, you can basically have it do that determination, sort of rank, all right, which are the publications that are more important for me to include and which are the ones that are less um, you can do that in a number of different ways. Uh, I have it here set to relevance, but you can also have it prioritize more recent citations um, or prioritize, for example, uh, articles that have received a larger number of supporting citations, kind of like we were doing in here when we were uh, telling the system to only show us you know, results that had at least X number of supporting citations, doing something similar but in the context of Site Assistant. Uh, finally, in terms of the uh, literature that it's searching, you can specify, uh, you can tell Assistant to only search, for example, in certain journals. So for example, science or nature. Um, and you can also tell it to only include uh, in its search papers uh, from a, a subset, a list of papers. So we have a feature here. I'll briefly just uh, switch around here. Um, oops, here we go. Uh, we have a feature called um, dashboards. Um, and dashboards are basically collections of uh, papers, collections of, um, of articles. So for example, um, this is a, uh, a um, a dashboard that I have constructed on information literacy. And it's got uh, 889 uh, articles. It'll give you a summary of how those articles have been cited. It'll give you what we call a site index. That is the basically the number of supporting citations uh, divided by the number of supporting plus contrasting citations. So higher is better. And it will also give you some information about all of those articles and give you the ability to sort and filter all the items uh, in one place. And as with everything else, you can export that data uh, to a couple of different formats. You can also um, create a new, um, uh, when you're in the, in the process of creating a new dashboard, you can uh, link that with uh, reference managers such as Zotero or Mendeley or upload a CSV file. Again, interoperability, big priority for us. Um, so in the context of Assistant, you can actually tell Assistant, hey, limit your search to papers that are in that dashboard. So if you've identified a set of papers and you basically want to have Assistant sort of talk with you about those papers, um, uh, it is, uh, uh, you can do that by limiting it to the papers in a given dashboard. Of course, those would have to be papers that are in the site system. Um, but you can also work with Assistant uh, going beyond what we have in terms of published ref uh, research and preprints. Um, you can uh, do what we call uh, a document analysis. So we have a, another feature, which I'll briefly just jump over to, um, called Reference Check. So reference check is an example of the, um, uh, is where you can actually upload a document to site and site will basically give you sort of a health check about the references in that paper. 
It will alert you to instances where you might have uh, referenced a paper that has, for example, been retracted. It'll show you how each of your references have themselves been cited. Um, we don't maintain any copies of any of the papers that are uploaded. We simply retain the data that we extract that are relevant to these reports. Well, once you've created one of those uh, uh, document analysis uh, analyses, you can actually have Site Assistant uh, use those uploaded, the, the results from those uploaded papers um, to answer your question. So if, for example, you have papers, uh, you know, um, working papers, white papers, uh, working drafts of manuscripts that you want to include that are maybe not published, um, you can always have uh, upload them as analyzed documents and include them in uh, assistance responses in that way. Um, okay, so I think um, uh, again, I want to be uh, you know, make sure we have time for for questions um, since uh, everyone has been uh, kind enough to hold their questions to the end. I think I'll go ahead and, and just uh, maybe stop the sort of formal uh, part of the presentation now and um, open for uh, Q&A. Uh, Igor and I are happy to, uh, to answer questions. Thank you, Sean, and thank you, Igor, for the fascinating presentations and all the advanced options. I am uh, really impressed and uh, very excited to see how we can um, get our teeth into it and put all the features to use. Mm. I then would like to ask if anyone has any questions, feel free to uh, raise your hand or pose your question in the chat. I do have one uh, question to start off with. I was wondering, so I imagine the Wikipedia community is slightly different to many of your partners such as institutions like academic institutions or universities. Could you speak a bit more about your experience with different uh, partners? And I don't know if you had any partners who were mostly volunteer based, or if you could just speak about uh, the dynamic uh, that we are entering, so to say, and how that works. Yeah, sure. So um, my official title at uh, Research Solutions, which is now uh, or now part of uh, uh, site is now part of, um, is uh, head of academic relations. So I spend a lot of time talking to other academics, um, and um, we definitely uh, are are doing everything we can to sort of um, you know give back to uh, the broader sort of universe of uh, the open science community. I'm a big open science person um, in my academic and professional life. I'll, I have been since I got my first big person faculty job. Um, so uh, we, we as a company are very culturally aware of that and, and try to, to, um, to do as much as we can. One, one thing that I'll go ahead and, and just point out is we, we, um, we provide uh, an API and we provide uh, a segment of that to where uh, people can embed our data on any page for any article anywhere uh, for free. Um, uh, so that's that's one way that we uh, you know we try to give some some help in terms of designing the uh, the way that that appears. Um, so that's that's one thing. Um, we uh, we work with uh, Zotero for plugins. We work with uh, uh, browser uh, extensions. There's a site browser extension um, that uh, that we've developed. Um, that will give you a link and sort of a summary of everything. Um, in the past, in sort of uh, working with, uh, you know, obviously we've worked with Wikipedia data um, for some of our, our research. And um, I especially, I, I love playing with that kind of data and, and you know, deriving new insights um, from open data sets. That's one of my sort of nerdier favorite things to do. Um, on a rainy Sunday afternoon is find some data set somewhere and see what I can extract from it that others haven't uh, haven't done before. Um, so we're, we we do as much as we can to um, you know to interface and I, I we love working with researchers as well. So um, if anyone on this call uh, you know has a sort of um, 
a bibliometrics research question or a sociology of, of science or sociology of scholarship uh, question. Um, I always love chatting about that. Um, and so I'm happy for people to get in touch with me and, and uh, we'll see how we can work on sharing our data to help you answer those questions. Um, I hope, does that answer the question or I hope that answers the question? Uh, yeah, that's that's great. Thanks a lot. Um, we do have a few comments uh, in the chat and a question now. So I might read the comments. So we have um, a comment from Mate Nux who says, I like to test the LLM on this phrase, do beavers live in Ireland? And site seems to work fine for that and actually shows relevant studies. The, the, interestingly, asking in Polish gave a bit different answer and confabulating a bit in the text answer, but still the references were good. So that's uh, reassuring. Uh, thanks for checking that. And then Piotr says, um, I saw example of show me the list of 10 countries that uh, start with an O and Oman is the only country that passes this test. That is interesting. Um, I don't know if you have anything to, to respond to that or... Um, interesting. So I was sort of going in reverse order. I've not tried the sort of question about countries that start with a letter. My sense is that those are going to, the answer to that is going to mostly come from the GPT model rather than from ours, because that's not the kind of question that one would typically get. I'm not going to have to do a, a literature search to, you know, answer this scientific question. Um, so I'd have to play around with that a little bit myself to understand what's going on there. That's interesting. Um, thank you for pointing that out. Um, in terms of, uh, yeah, do beavers live in Ireland? I actually don't know the answer to that question. So I'm glad that assistant does. Um, okay. <laughs> um, you, you were mentioning, um, yes, as asking in Polish, perhaps going to give you a different answer. One thing that is important to remember about these these systems is that they are all you know probabilistic. So each time you ask it a question, you're you you very well might get a slightly different answer with a slightly different set of sources. Um, it's just a function of way of the way that these systems work. Although I would point out, um, is not necessarily terribly different than the you know you, what it would be like speaking to like a reference librarian or an expert on a topic. You know, I, I study moral psychology. If you ask me a, a question on moral psychology, sometimes I might tell you to go read one paper and other times I might tell you to go read another. Um, might have to do with, you know, how I'm feeling that day or how you phrase the question. Um, the one thing about um, confabulating, I let me uh, go ahead and, and say something that I should have said earlier and I, I just neglected to. Um, when we first launched Assistant, uh, I used to go around saying that assistant will never make up any references. It will never hallucinate. It will never confabulate. Um, again, I like this new term. Uh, then one day, one of our users emailed us and said, I think it made up a reference. And I was like, surely not. This can't possibly tr be true. How is this? Surely not. And no, it actually was totally true. It had it had hallucinated a reference. Um, and I, I have since seen this happen once myself. Um, so, and I use it every day, uh, but I've seen this happen once. And um, what it will actually do is, whereas all of the links that are real, you'll notice have the underline and they have the pop-up window next to them. When it made up a reference the one time I saw it, it was not underlined. It didn't have any link to anything because it was not a real reference. Um, so uh, the thing that I now say instead is that um, assistant won't, uh, you, the vast majority of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, it's not going to hallucinate. And if it does, it'll be really obvious. Um, and I actually, I think we've actually pretty much fixed that problem. We've since gone back and, and done a little more exploration. I think now I probably could say 100% of the time it's not going to make anything up um, or really close to it, but I try to be a bit more conservative now just because you never know with these we things. Can, we can accept this as a challenge for our community. <laughs> see there we go. We, find. Uh, we have two more questions in the chat and I am conscious of time, uh, so I will move on to Adrian's question. What percentage of the world's body of knowledge do you cover? 
Are there any important publishers missing? Do you cover all the articles indexed by Google Scholar? Um, so we we do everything. Here we go. Um, I'm sure I'm still sharing my screen, right? Yes. Um, so if you go to this page, data and services, it's a link that's on the bottom of every site page. Um, you'll get our latest sort of metrics. This will show you basically how many works we have in our system. This works covered is basically going to be anything with a DOI. And so that is a difference between site and Google Scholar uh, as just one example. Um, Google Scholar encompasses uh, things beyond what uh, has a DOI. Um, so in the thing that's most noticeable is probably books. Um, some books have document identifiers. Some book chapters will have document identifiers. A lot of them do not. Um, so there, uh, you will see a a uh, a smaller coverage uh, with our uh, you know with our tool. Um, however, I think if you um, compare sort of the larger fields and you know how much they rely on things, the vast majority of the things you're going to be interested in are going to be things with DOIs and will therefore be part of what we cover in, in, in our work. Um, the other thing that I'll point out, um, um, you know, in terms of coverage, we try to be very, very transparent about this. So if you go to this page here, uh, site.ai slash journals, um, you'll uh, see uh, this, this ability here to uh, basically search for a journal name or a publisher name. And you can then see what, you know, what journals we have in our system and then how many sites we have in our system for an individual uh, publisher or for an individual uh, journal. Um, so we try to be uh, quite transparent about that. Um, we get our data from a variety of sources. We get them from open access papers, author publications, uh, but we also have indexing agreements with major publishers. Uh, in fact, most major publishers, uh, only a couple of exceptions, notable exceptions. Um, so they will send us the entirety of their back catalog, including closed access, as well as ongoing deposits of new papers. Um, so uh, we think our coverage is actually quite good, especially compared to other AI tools, which primarily rely uh, only on closed access uh, papers, or sorry, open access papers. Rather. Great, thank you. We have a few more minutes and one more question from Michal. What would be further opportunities to, for example, automate the process, starting with reconciliation like mass and then live, verific live verification of citations used on Wikipedia, and also see the coverage of site AI regarding the citations used in Wikipedia? So I believe actually the last part of that question you can find um, in this paper, which I'm happy to send you a, a, a copy of. I'm happy to share. I believe that that, or I can just look it up in that paper and, and find for you. Um, it was very much limited by DO, it was really just, if I recall correctly, it was limited by DOIs or PubMed IDs. Um, in terms of further opportunities to, you know, automate, um, uh, you know, uh, reconciliation with, with Wikipedia, that is something that we would be very interested in. And in fact, um, both myself and uh, my business partner and co-founder, Josh Nicholson, um, Josh, was really interested in this idea for for a while before we we um we sort of moved to different things. But um, this is something that we've basically been interested in working with Wikipedia since day one. Um, so uh, I would be very much interested, uh, Mikhail, and and anyone else who's interested um, in chatting about that. And um, yeah, we would be interested in in what we would be interested in seeing who is interested on the Wikimedia side of that because I think there's a lot that we could do. Um, both in research and in sort of uh, helping to bolster uh, Wikipedia and the way articles are cited within Wikipedia. So, Great. There is some uh, future food for thought or uh, some directions of travel. That sounds fantastic. Um, Igor, I don't know if you have anything to add. Oh, I think uh, Sean is is covering it perfectly. So uh, it's it's a it's a great, well organized event. Thank you so much, Cassia. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Um, I realize we have not had that many technical questions, but our trial period has only started yesterday, and some people are still getting access. So 
that might um, come up in the laundry, as we say in Polish, uh, uh, as we go throughout the six weeks. I understand we do have access to quite extensive um, instructions and how to's plus a contact email in case people have any questions about anything about the platform. Uh, but I think um, also feel free to email me if you are interested in signing up or have any technical questions, I can always pass them on to the team. Um, yes, so we have um, the sign up link to use the tool for six weeks. Like I said, we will then be asking your opinions on site and to share your um, your um, experience uh, with with the tool. Um, I don't know about you. I am super excited. Thank you so much for uh, for sharing the possibilities of a site and um, all your insights. Uh, thank you so much again. Uh, thank you, Sean. Thank you, Igor. Thank you, Beatrice, for making this uh, happen. Uh, thank you to our team, to Yola, Natalia, uh, Damian, and Wojciech for translating. I have been swapping to the audio. That sounds like a massive amount of work. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for everyone who joined us this evening to share your time with us and ask your questions. Um, yes, I think with that, we are ready to close.